Okay, so this is the last structural change. Um, now, let's take those few sentences, right? So you want to fill in the gaps. And it's, the sentence starts with I am. And, you know, I could fill something in like I'm happy, I'm angry, you know, I don't know, I'm hungry. Um, now for the next part, you know, I am mm, very hungry. A pretty likely thing that you could fill in is I'm not very hungry. Or maybe if you have, you know, a teenage kid, then, then he might say, hey, I'm very, very hungry. I could, you know, whatever. But they might quite likely, you know, use the very last sentence, you know, I'm very, very hungry. I could eat half a pig, right? Or something like that. Um, so, in other words, what happens after the I am blank matters very much to what the appropriate thing is to fill into that blank spot. Now, if we have an LSTM or any other RNN that just keeps on going forward, we miss out on this. Right? So very different words depend on the future context of the word rather than just you know, what we've seen in the past. And overall, we know that interpolation is a lot easier than prediction. For instance, you know, if somebody told you, well, in the year 2019, Amazon stock price is going to be $1,850, well, with that benefit of hindsight, taking a time machine moving 10 years into the past, well, you could be a spectacularly successful investor, right? Because what you simply do is, you know, you buy the shares when they are cheap, and then, hey, I'm so good at investing, right? No, you just use the benefit of hindsight. Now, if we have an interpolation problem and we don't use the future information, then we're just doing something stupid, right? So, therefore, if we have such NLP problems, well, we should use the future too. And so, what are we supposed to do? So let's go back to statistics. So I promise it's not going to be too painful, but let's look a little bit what you, know, you would do if you were you know, a classically trained statistician. You would probably use something like a hidden Markov model. In that hidden Markov model, you might, for instance, have something like P of HT given HT minus 1 and XT minus 1. So this is like the hidden state update function that we ha had in our RNM before, where we had you know, HT is some function f of HT minus 1 and XT minus 1. And then we have some output, right? So P of XT given HT and XT minus 1, which you can also use, right? And then, you know, you can model the sequence jointly and you solve by dynamic programming. Who has done this thing before? Okay, two. Okay, three. Good. Um, so fear not, we'll actually do this a little bit now. And don't worry about the math. Um, this is just to give us some intuition about how we then can do the same thing without having to do all this math. Okay. So let's write out the joint probability, right? So P of X and H is P of H1, hidden state, times P of X1 given H1. So that's the emissions probability, right? And then I have this very long chain, P of HT given T minus 1 times P of XT given HT. Actually, I could have made my life a little bit easier by introducing artificially the symbol H0 and then just written pH of H1 given H0 where H0 is the start symbol, right? Would have looked prettier, but uh, bear with me for a moment. So here's what we want, right? We want to get P of X because what we want to do is, let's say we want to fill in a particular word, we need to integrate over all the, the words up to position t, so basically up to position t minus 1, really, and from position t plus 1 up to the end. Okay. And unfortunately, even in the simplest case where maybe the hidden state is just, you know, ones or zeros, if I have a link, sequence of lengths t, 
And this sum now over all the h's goes over 2 to the t possible symbols. Right. Because every one is you know, binary and I have a sequence of links t, so it's 2 to the t. OK, so this is mission impossible unless we come up with something smart. And the smart thing is dynamic programming. Um, so the first thing we can do is we can pull out every term involving h1. Right? So nothing has happened yet if I go from the first line to the second line. But I'm also going to pull out the summation over h1 directly. So I have sum over h1, p of h1, p of x1 given h1 times p of h2 given h1. And if I sum over h1, then I just get some pi 2 of h2. So now I have something that looks very similar to what we started out with, but I got rid of the summation of h1. And so I, you know, this is a simple function. I can just tabulate it, you know, what pi 2 of h2 should assume. So then I write it out as a sum over h2, and I pull out all the terms involving h2. So we have pi 2 of h2 p of h2 and x, uh, of x2 given h2 times p of h3 given h2, right? So this block. And we sum over all the h2s, and the, this gets abbreviated into pi 3 of h3. And I can just peel off one term after the other as I move from the left to the right. So there's a more general theory behind it. It's called the generalized distributive law. And a couple of very, very nice papers. So one by um, Lurliga and Xishang, and another one. So that's actually the more readable one. Uh, that's about factor graphs. And then there's the paper called The Generalized Distributive Law. They both pretty much use the same idea, but the Lurliga and Xishang and Frey paper is a lot more readable. So that would be so. Lurliga would be, I think, the I don't know whether it's the lead author. It's some time ago, but yeah, that paper came out around 2005. It's beautifully written. Um, in any case, so if you want to dive deep into this, this is cool, this paper. Now, but what we get is we get this forward pass, right? So we get basically pi t plus 1 of h t plus 1 is sum over h t of pi t of h t, p of x t given h t times p of h t plus 1 given h1. Uh, well, given h t, so this is actually a typo. Let me quickly fix this. So this looks very similar to what we had in our RNN, right? So we have basically, if, if I assume that pi t is my hidden state rather than ht itself, then I basically get that you know my new hidden state is some function of the previous hidden state and you know some observation xt. Okay, and that just iterates through. Now what I can do is I can do the entire thing also backwards. So I can basically start summing up from the end. So I peel out the last variable, h capital T. And I sum over everything that I have from there, and I get some you know, function rho. And I work my way from the end towards the beginning. So in other words, I have, now if you look at that, you basically have a forward pass, which has a hidden state that gets updated moving left to right. And I have a hidden state that gets updated moving right to left. OK, so at some point, those two are going to meet. The left pass carries all the information up to that blank position coming from before. The right pass carries all the information that came from afterwards. And so I can use those two to then come up with a better estimate of what should be at position xj, given all the context. 
So if I'm a good statistician, and this is a simple first order Markov model, and I can solve all the integrals, the bottom line is the one you see up there. OK. So if you've never done dynamic programming and graphical models, this may have looked a little bit scary. The good thing is, this was mostly intuition and context. Now, obviously, we want to do that with RNNs. So here's the idea. You do exactly the same thing as what we had with graphical models before, just that you drop the statistical meaning and interpretation that we had in graphical models before. So you probably start noticing a pattern of what's going on with how people go to deep learning. You take some functional forms that worked before, and then you generalize them and say, well, rather than this specific functional form, let's just make the entire thing learnable. So the mechanics still stay the same, but the meaning is now essentially just abstracted away. So this sounds really grand, but it's actually very simple. You just have one LSTM running from the start to the finish, and another LSTM running from the finish to the start. You get corresponding representations, and then you produce an output. Okay. Can anybody see a problem with what I just did? Any, can anybody see a problem? OK, let me show you what happens if you run this. OK. So thing is, you know, this converges beautifully, right? I can, so fortunately, you know, the Gluon RNN library offers a bidirectional LSTM. I set the flag and I invoke it. And I'll show you how to set this flag in a moment. And I get this utterly gorgeous perplexity, right? I get something that's ridiculously close to 1. It's you know, 1.002, right? And it's fast, and everything's great. So, And then if I try to use that to predict the next token, it fails miserably. OK, does anybody have an idea why? You know, this is. So clearly a bad idea, you know, even so, you know, I can run the code and so, but it's, you know, it's clearly stupid. What happened? Um, not necessarily. You have, you know, forward pass, backward pass, and then, you know, you're just trying to fill in that one character, right? You don't know the answer for that, but you're very, very close in what you suggested. Exactly. So what happens is this, right? Um, and yeah, by the way, that next lecture part is not true. This is this is the next lecture. But basically, what happens is during training time, you know, you basically have the green nodes going forwards and backwards to fill in the blue node. And at test time, you don't have the second part. You don't have the luxury of knowing what comes afterwards. So if I wanted to build a spell checker, I could actually do this. So a very primitive spell checker or spell corrector, non-parametric one, would work based on that. What you would do is you would basically use a bidirectional STM and try to estimate which character fits in this particular location. With for a spell checker or spell corrector, you actually know this. And the question that you're trying to answer there is, which character is out of place? And I was a little bit tempted to actually hand that out as homework. Um, don't worry, we'll, homework is actually going to be a little bit easier. Um, but basically, the thing is that the you know the poor bidirectional STM doesn't actually know you know what comes later, and that's why then at test time it fails to do well because it doesn't know what the next symbol is. 
So that's like you're training an interpolator and you're tr then asking it to do well for prediction and no can do. And you know, that, that's clearly the case. I mean, this is garbage. If you manage to get that type of perplexity with just a forward looking model, um, you'd get a paper and a wired interview and a whole bunch of other things, right? So that's why. Okay, so that sounds kind of, you know, weird, but so, you know, I'm teaching you stuff and then it doesn't work, so why am I teaching you this, right? Well, part of the reason is that those bidirectional STMs are really good for encoding a source sequence to then translate it to a target sequence. So for instance, if I want to translate something from English into German, I may very well want to run a bidirectional LSTM here, right? And I have maybe something else here that goes backwards. And since my entire you know, source sequence is given in its full glory, I can actually run this nicely to encode. My decoder then actually has to be unidirectional. It cannot be bidirectional. But the encoder can be. Yes? Correct. Well, that would be, that would give us exactly the problem that, that I showed you here, right? So basically, don't use bidirectional LSTMs for sequence forward prediction. Just do not do that. So what if we just want to do something like binary classification? Yep. Then it's perfect, right? So for, you know, binary classification, sentiment estimation, in other cases, this is a really great tool. But for sequence generation, it's exactly the wrong thing to use. Yes? Why is the decoder like unidirectional? Well, because I need to generate one word at a time. Now, some people have tried to generate entire sentences at a time, right? Where, you know, similar to what you would do with super resolution in images, where you go and, you know, you get some parts and you refine and you refine until it, in the end, you have a manifestation of, you know, a sentence. Nobody's really nailed that problem very well yet. Part of the reasons, I guess, is that the word order between different languages can be very different. So not just individual words, but entire sub-sentences. So in German, for instance, uh, well, people like to split verbs into two parts, and one goes in the beginning, one goes in the end, right? Or in Japanese, you have, you know, the ka at the end, and then all of a sudden everything becomes a question. And until you knew that, well, you wouldn't. And so different languages have really weird properties in terms of how they order words. And that's why you can't just quite so easily do this. Or in some cases, you know, you might have some expressions, like it's raining cats and dogs. Well. There is no translation of that expression into pretty much any other language that sounds fine. You'd have to replace it with something entirely different, right? So, so trying to find a literal translation would fail and it would produce very bad quality. So consequently, you neither have a one-to-one -one correspondence in ordering nor in extent. There are some cases where this applies, and that's, for instance, for images. So if you do image super resolution, you have a very nice one-to-one -one correspondence as you super resolve the image further and further and add more pixels, right? But for language, not so much. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. We will get your Yes, we will get to this in the next few slides. Okay, so bear with me for another few minutes. Um, any other questions? Okay, good. 
So then let's have a very quick 